first. So one, as far as housekeeping goes, if you'd like to speak, please um, raise your hand in using the reactions buttons down below. Um, meanwhile, put in your, your name and where you're from in the chat box for all to say hello to you. But the way we'll moderate this session is we'll go through question by question, starting with the first question. And if you have a response or a thought to that particular question, I ask that you raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you. Um, and then what we will do is we will switch over to the chat box. And if we don't have any hands raised for like a five second period, we can switch over to the chat box at that point as well. So um, let's are there any questions? If so, put it in the chat box. Any questions about the process that is? And I don't see any at the moment. Thanks everyone for representing where you are. And we'll start at this point. So the first question, um, and Natha, thank you for putting that in the chat box, is as it relates to our SPINS projects and um, implementation fund, implementation science, projects in particular, what challenges are you all as recipients and your sub-recipients facing with using an implementation science approach? And if you remember, HAB released an implementation science framework back in 2020, and that publication is available online. But um, in addition to using, whether it's the HAB approach or other implementation science approaches that are out there, what challenges are you all facing with integrating these approaches into your work? So I will look for hands. And it's kind of hard to start. All right. Janet Myers, I see you. Right. You know, hi, LaQuanda. Thanks for calling on me. Um, I, uh, I'll just launch, I'll just put it out there. Um, so we've used the Hab IS uh, framework in most of our projects recently. I think, um, I, I think it's, um, E2I actually didn't start with it, but it, we folded it in over time. So I, I think we find the Hab, um, the framework really helpful, especially because it, uh, is, it's kind of a meta framework and brings together a lot of things that, a lot of components on the, the sort of implementation side and the outcome side that work for us. So I just wanted to shout out for that. Um, but I think the biggest challenge we have is, well, there's two things. The main one is time. These, uh, and I, I I probably sound like a broken record, but these three-year initiatives, it just isn't enough time to, to do the you know, the planning and the pre-work and the setting up and then, you know, the the actual evaluation and technical assistance piece and, and then get to the outcomes. And by the end, uh, you all are pushing us to disseminate before we've really had a chance to process and um, and uh, not, not even necessarily publish, but even process the data to figure out what the outcomes are. So I would say time. And then the other, the other one for us, and it's just uh, by virtue of the initiatives that we've been funded to implement, um, it's just the number of interventions per initiative. I think um, thanks to Starly Shade and um, and our colleagues at UCSF, we figured out a way to do it, but uh, I think we'd get sort of deeper results if we didn't have so many interventions per initiative, but I think those are unique to kind of two IS and E2I. Thanks. Thank you, Janet. And Janet, as it relates to number of interventions per initiative, is it that you all are being required to implement a certain number and you think that if you had some flexibility to choose one or two that that will make things a lot easier to implement. Yes, I absolutely do. And, and a, an example of that is the rapid initiative. So we, um, we Starly and I were, Starly was just talking about this the other day, uh, the rapid initiative, we've been able to do sort of a more comprehensive and maybe more real-time evaluation because it's one clinical intervention and it's pretty, you know, specific that's being carried out across the sites. And so um, we've been able to put our attention in evaluation tools and the, the performance measures in particular that the sites are using. So it's more responsive in an ongoing way to what the sites need, I would say. And then the, the bigger ones, we have to do kind of a more high level evaluation. It's kind of almost a different animal. It, it, it works, but we don't have... Uh, the time and resources to kind of dig in and do very specific um, evaluation pieces that that match the interventions if there's more than one or even more than two, like you said. So yeah, that'd be ideal. One or two would, it would make our day, I think. <laughs> Thanks. I understand. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am having trouble seeing my, the, the gallery mode for our tech person. Can you give me a little assist here? 
because I can't, otherwise I'm trying to flip through. I've done side by side. I don't have any other options to do gallery mode again. Who is our tech person online? <laughs> Not that were we supposed to have a tech person in each of the breakouts, or we only had one person for the main session? Yes, we only had uh, Jason as the main person. Yeah. Oh. But you're clicking side by side gallery and it's not working? Well, I, I click it, but it's giving me a gallery. So I'm having to click the down button to see other people as opposed to seeing the full gallery. I could see the full gallery a minute ago but I'm having to like click down to see if any hands are raised. Oh, LaQuanta, you can um, pull the little um, on the side where, of the gallery, pull it out and so it'll expand your gallery. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> if, you, if you click on participants at the bottom and it says participants 50, if you click on that, that next to your tiles, you should have a list of all the participants. It's easier to scroll, maybe. Okay. Well, I'll make that screen larger then. <laughs> I just won't see as many faces. Okay, I'll do that option. And then I think you can sort by who has their hand hand raised potentially. Hey, look on. I think you can also click on view and select uh, which view you like. Yeah, I tried that, but it wouldn't. It's only giving me limited. That's okay. We'll work it out. We'll work it out. I don't want to hold you all up. I don't see any hands. Are there any questions in the chat box, Natha, that popped up during the last discussion? So we've heard about the, the piece around time. Um, are others experiencing the same? So I want to go back to um, Let's go back to, I want to go back to Janet. Janet had a a, a comment about um, not, not so much as time. I, I do understand because we continuously hear the comment about time, but also she was talking about the number of, the number of, the interventions. Number of interventions. And sometimes um, when you replicate, when you're trying to replicate a lot of um, interventions at one time, it gets um, taxing or tricky. Um, and so um, I, I'm, what I'm hearing is it may be more beneficial to limit or reduce, I put, that, put it that way, reduce the number of interventions that you are looking at evaluating um, in terms of replicating or um, doing uh, replicating at one time. Yeah, and I would I I I I know Dimitri is about to throw something at me, but um, you know what? Maybe it's not. It it could be that for sure. Um, but it also could be limiting it to a type of intervention. So the issue for us, and I, you know, I when we teach evaluation, I try to. Um, tell people don't let the evaluation drive the program because really you want the, pro the program should be the program, right? The evidence-based intervention or the evidence-informed intervention implemented, and then you figure out how to evaluate it. But it's, it's, I guess it's more feasible to evaluate if the interventions are similar or of a certain type. So doing something that's uh, clinically based um, is, you know, often different than something that you do in the community or in a, you know, in a group setting or, you know, that kind of thing. So it just, it, it sort of changes the, the, the amount of evaluation of implementation you can do depending on what the, what the interventions are. So, yeah, I would right. say one or the other. I, yeah. I get it. So limiting the number and, and potentially limiting so limiting the number of interventions and maybe potentially limiting the number of sites. Yeah, which I think has kind of happened in the past and, and oh, look at my colleagues, they're ready to go too. Um, and I think um, it's, it's, we've just had, we've done it. I'm, I actually, I have to say, I'm very proud of the work we've done on E2I, very proud. And the evaluation results are definitely higher level than um, other initiatives that we worked on in the past. Mm -hmm. Awesome. 
Thank you, Janet, so much. And one of you, you have colleagues putting in the chat box that they echo that sentiment as well. Thank you, um, Beth Bordeaux, for, for sharing that, that thought. Um, we have a comment from Starly Shade around CBOs and the tendency to have um, difficulty tracking clients. Starly, can you come off mute and share a little bit more about that comment that you made? Did we lose you, Starly? Starly is traveling today. I'm not sure. She may not be in a place where she can come off mute. Okay. Okay. We'll let her get get her get to a point where she can. Meanwhile, we'll we have a, a couple of others there. Um, Allison Bogman. You speak a little bit about the Sure Housing Initiative. Hi, yes. Um, thanks, thanks for the the opportunity. And I I, I did really appreciate Janet's comment and the the responses that others have have um, entered into the chat and into the conversation. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what we're talking about right now as the evaluation provider and really interested in um, talking about with HRSA and the implementation technical assistance provider as well, who we're going to be meeting in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, we and it's a it's really a challenge sometimes to find that balance because you know sites know their um, communities and the context in which they operate, and so you want to allow them to you know to try out or implement interventions that will work in their in their settings. But you know you also it's 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 a challenge for evaluation when you let you know a thousand flowers bloom. Um, and so uh, just to say that that's a challenge that we are, um, we're talking about as a evaluation provider team right now. Mm -hmm. And um, what you all have said has been really helpful. We also have the additional challenge of not just, you know, all of the different choices for housing related interventions, but um, the focus populations. So um, you know, the demonstration sites are perhaps going to be you know, focusing on different focus populations and are we gonna be able to evaluate similar interventions if they are focused on different um, different subpopulations and, and what does that you know, mean for the evaluation? What does that look like? So mm -hmm. um, we're um, hopefully just gonna be talking with HRSA and the ITAP about the, the best way to find that balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I am going to skip down a little bit. And thank you so much, Allison, for that feedback. Um, Dimitri, are you on the line with us today? Yep, highly Quanta. Awesome, awesome. There was a there was a comment put in the chat box um, around. It looks like central to implementation when you don't have a comparison group, and you and you responded about a sweet spot. Yeah, so in our <clears throat> in our 2IS initiative uh, that we work on with Janet and, and Beth and Starley and, and the team from UCSF, I see Greg is here too, Greg also, um, we, we really tried in that initiative to ensure that we would have at least two sites implementing every intervention. Um, and so you know, one of the difficulties we difficulties we face is when we're trying to understand did something work because of something that happened at the site where the intervention was implemented. It's a lot harder to say whether or not something worked if you don't have a comparison. Um, but comparison is kind of a strong word, right? Because these are unique sites with unique staff and settings and clients, and so it's not it's not a, a control in the sense of like a, a randomized controlled trial. So I think we're just having some some back and forth banter in the chat about, uh, you know, we, we do want to see a reduced number of interventions. And we have done that from like E2I was the first version of a similar type of project that had more interventions. Um, and we have fewer in 2IS. Uh, 
but we also want to make sure that we're implementing it across enough sites that we have at least some ground to speak from when making claims that certain implementation strategies were helpful versus others. So I think the the back and forth in the chat is really um, on this topic of finding the balance, which I which others have also spoken to, trying to figure out if we if we can't significantly expand the length of time for these initiatives. I wonder if there if if anyone in the room has thoughts on what might be the right balance. So if we could have at least two sites implementing intervention, you know, would we want to aim for having more than two sites? Would we want to have uh, fewer sites and fewer interventions? Just curious, yeah, for any thoughts on that front. I think we're all interested in this idea of balance and and finding the sweet spot. I see Starla Shade's hand is up. Starla, are you able? Hi, everybody. Apologies. I'm in an airport. So, um, so um, I would recommend, you know, I said this in the chat, but discrete interventions are much easier to, to implement and evaluate than system level interventions. So that's another consideration. Um, I definitely feel like more sites per intervention will help us evaluate those interventions, um, as opposed to more interventions per focal area. Mm -hmm. I get it. So we're talking about diffusion a little bit here, you know, diffusing fewer interventions across more sites will probably give us a bigger bang for the buck. And I know you're in an airport, so you probably have an immediate <laughs> often. Um, but thank you, Starla, for that. And thank you, Dimitri, as well. Um, we had a comment here from Jessica Xavier at UCSF. Jessica, I, I think it may be helpful to hear your perspective, given that you were a part of an initial, the, I, looks, I think it's the E2I cohort in 2015, 2021. What were some of the challenges that you all encountered back then? And Corliss, I see your hand. Thanks, that was the very first um... Um, a spins effort at an imp true implementation science initiative. And while we had four replicable uh, interventions pre-chosen for that initiative, this was actually the first time we had implemented a uh, IS model, I believe using the Proctor model. My uh, colleague, Corliss Heath, can probably speak even more to that. Um, Corliss? Hold on. Okay, yes. So, um, yes, it, it was the Proctor model, and Jane is saying the Proctor model because Jane also um, worked um, on that as well. Um, and I um, succeeded Jessica with that. And one of the things, as someone was saying, um, it kind of goes to what um, Janet was saying, or as some individuals were talking about comparison groups. Um, um, it, and I, one of the things that I said, not so much as a comparison group, but what we did was look at, we took four different, inter, we took four interventions, but in looking at those four um, um, interventions in terms of replications, you had four specific replications and you had, um, and then you had um, a, a number of sites. And so therefore you were looking at these four interventions in um, <clears throat> a number of sites and therefore you you looked at what the replication of those intervention looked like in different parts of the country in different sites that may have had different types of geographic locations, different types of populations and so forth. And that would tell you, looking at the evaluation of what that looked like in terms of, um, of implementing um, and so um, that was still that true implementation science because you had that what type of adaptability did you need to do, what type of adjustments did you do need based on your demographics, based on your settings, based on your um, population um, and in terms of replications and then having to go then going in and writing an, an implementation manual based on that. And, and we also have a, a couple of people who also are in here. Uh, I think that probably in there we have a, a Alexis. Um, I see Alexis um, who worked on that intervention. Alicia um, Downs is also um, in this group. Um, so Jan, 
Janet Jane, um, Jane Fox, and I, I think Nicolay is on here who may have put the target HIV. So um, uh, yeah, and I'll just stop there. Right. And speaking of Jane, Jane, I see your hand. Would you like to, do you have any tidbits to share from those, from the DEI program that, you know, that you think will be beneficial to the group as far as understanding challenges with implementation science? Yeah, I think, um, thank you, Corliss, for teeing this up. Um, and Janet, or sorry, Jessica as well. Um, having four discrete interventions with three sites each, um, to evaluate was really helpful. And what it helped us do as evaluators is uh, identify those core components of each one of the interventions, um, as well as, as Corla said, what needs to be adapted, what needed to be um, worked around for whatever the type of agency it was that was implementing it for the community, for the geographic region. Um, so being able to then uh, create manuals and toolkits to go back out to the community that listed these core components. If you're going to do this intervention, these are the things that are core to it. And then sharing with folks um, the diversions that may need to happen to adapt um, and replicate this in different settings. Thank you so much, Jane. And in the interest of time, if you all have any additional thoughts around challenges, um, Stacy, should we direct them to you or is a, or can you put a contact person that folks should direct questions to after the fact, after today, given that we have a limited amount of time with so many great thoughts? Yeah, people can email me. That's fine. I can put my um, email address. Oh. I can't talk and type apparently <laughs> at the same time. I put my email address in the chat if anybody wants to follow up on anything. Happy awesome. to. Thank you, Stacey. Mm -hmm. so, so let's move on to the next question. And this talks about what supports that you think are needed or strategies that you use to improve the integration of implementation science within your SPINS initiative. So now we, we've talked a little bit about challenges. Now we're talking about supports and things that have worked well or things that you've done to, to make the best use of what you had. Um, so we'll, we'll open the floor for, for those specific comments as well. And Starly, I know you're in the airport. I don't know if your hand is raised to make a comment or not, um, but I see you. You may not have it, she lowered it, okay, awesome. All right, so we know that folks, are engaged in this work. Tell, share with the group what you know. What are some of the strategies that you're using? Um, Nicolay, I see you. Okay, um, I have a uh, just an observation or question as a someone who's at the very end of the process, <laughs> and I just always thought there was a tension with people kind of reporting out what they did, which um, you know kind of needs to be comprehensive, uh, and uh, providing information about what worked best. <laughs> so a lot of times, all of the in, all of the interventions are treated equally when we describe them on target HIV. But I just know that they weren't all equal. <laughs> you know that some of them were probably more effective than others. Mm -hmm. But that information, I I don't know if that just goes to the professional literature and I never see it, <laughs> or or like what happens with that and. I think for people on the site, having some kind of information like that would help them choose which one mm -hmm. to try. Okay. And this is more so speaking on how, how it's marketed on target HIV or any, any dissemination products, Nicolet, correct? Um, yeah, or just even what, what story are you telling? Are you telling this is everything we did story or are you telling these are the things that work story? Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Janet, I see you. Go ahead. Thank you. So Nicolay, the short answer is it's complicated. <laughs> I um I was I I actually I think it kind of at the beginning of E2I, but even before that, we were kind of trying to think about a way to 
rate things or rank things or, you know, five stars, four stars, you know, and then we actually sat down and tried to figure out a way to do it. And we realized that we couldn't because it depends on so many things. It depends on the organization. It depends on the population. And it depends on whether you want to do a group level intervention or a clinic level intervention, whether or not you want to impact cl clinical outcomes, which of course HRSA wants us to impact, but also whether or not you want to change the implementation outcome of acceptability or of of um, or of integration. So it, that's that's the problem. Is the the sort of the matrix of possible considerations that people would use to select an intervention? It, it depends on so many factors. So we haven't figured out a way to do it. It'd be fun to like be locked in a room for a weekend, at least for me, to try to figure that out. But we just haven't being able to do that because like I said, it is complicated. Mm. I see, I see. Thank you, Janet, so much. Others, Jane, I saw a comment you made as well. Jane Fox. Yeah, so uh, exactly. I, I think um, just because it was done doesn't necessarily means, mean that it worked. Um, and, and to Janet's point, what are the metrics meaning that it worked? Um, was it something that could be integrated into a clinic setting or an organizational um, setting? But then does it really do the thing um, that, that we want it to do? And, and sometimes I think we saw, yes, it did. And then sometimes we were like, no, not so sure. Um, but, but at the same time, the government has invested a ton of money into these. Um, and, we, and, and I understand the desire to push this information back out to others to replicate. But I think maybe, um, and, and I agree with Janet, maybe it would be great to put together a tap to, to come up with some metrics to be a bit more judicious about um, what is then put out as um, a best practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There's another question I have here, and, and it, it speaks a little bit about sustainability. Um, so we've heard about many of the challenges of being able to, to you know, to um, display what works best in, in a sense. Um, but there's a question about sustainability here, and it talks about whether or not folks have thought on how you are sustaining or how one can sustain the work of the STEMS project after having used the IS framework. Um, and of course, can it be translated to a, a, a quality improvement effort within organizations? So, um, and I think this will speak more, this will also help have understand, you know, what is needed around capacity building for sites after the fact. Um, you know, the sustainability plans and things of that nature. So if folks have thoughts about that, can you please share? And again, the question is, what are your thoughts about um, helping Ryan White sites sustain an IS framework after the SPANS project is over? Well, after the funding period for the federal funding period. And I'm like, maybe we should have sent these questions out in advance because I know for me, I'm 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 more cerebral, so I need a little time to think and process. But um, Jane, I saw your hand, and then I saw you, Alexis. I mean, I'll start off with saying the obvious: it's money. Um, a, a lot of times, um, when we get to the and 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 I would say that pretty much everyone on this call who's done this work, we start talking sustainability from the get go. Um, and just because we talk about it doesn't mean that folks can can sustain it. Um, and so I do think that, um, and, and I think this leads into your, your optional question. If we want sites to continue doing this work and if we want to disseminate and increase uptake, there has to be HAB funding to do this, whether it's um, prioritizing Part C dollars to use um, some of these these interventions that have been studied, um, Part D dollars to to do to support the uptake, and then support for those um, to keep doing them that have already started this work. It's I that's one of the things that makes me the saddest about this is you see the great work um, over the years of the projects, and then it falls off because they just can't financially sustain it. Mm -hmm. And Jane, to that point, is it 
is I mean, is is are the projects so much so integrated to where you can't sustain pieces of it? I, yeah, and we've, we've seen varying degrees of sustainability for sure. Um, it's the rare, rare might be too strong of a word. There are some sites that can sustain the entire intervention, but, but then what we start to see is this watered down version where they can sustain bits and pieces. Got it. Um, and, and that's different than what we've studied and what we've you know, supported for the years of, the, of this, the SPINS work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Alexis. What's yeah, I'm just agreeing with Jane about uh, financing and how we're going to pay for this. So um, I think the point of your original question was like, how do sites continue to measure using an implementation science approach after we, the ETAPs and the ITACs leave? Um, and I think that they at least from the DEII initiative, I think they were very interested and appreciated the approach and felt like they were learning a lot, but they didn't have a fully funded evaluator through the initiative and then to continue the evaluation after we left. So we could leave them with tools, um, but I think as they were triaging all of the, the more urgent things on their plate, just didn't have the capacity to sit down and use all of the proctor model tools that we had used with them. Mm -hmm. So I think the desire is there. I just think the reality of triaging the urgent, um, they just couldn't handle it um, without a full-time funded person. Right. Thanks, Alexis. And there are several other comments that are worth noting in the chat box. I'm sorry if I can't put everybody on the mic, um, but just to call out a few, Janet, you talk about qualitative findings and using that as a way for tell storytelling um, for what it actually takes so people can have a bird's eye view um, of, of what's needed to actually implement these interventions. And you also mentioned the use of case studies um, that you all learned from in your implementation. And then Allison, I see your comment also um, about helping sites take up the interventions. But then there was another piece that kind of speaks to you, um, speak to your, your comment, Greg put it, posted it right after it talks about practical value, you know, especially when it comes to the clinics that are having to implement this work. You have folks who are, it's, I will tell you from personal experience, it's hard to be a clinician and then shift your mind to the programming lens and, and try to do everything that's involved with the program and piece as well as maintain the clinical aspect and do it successfully. So um, as a clinician, I know it, it's, it's you, we gotta find the value added of what this intervention brings to care and what it brings to, to the clinic and how the clinic functions and what the clinic is there to do. And so um, Greg, to your point, you're, you're spot on that there has to be some practical value that folks can see in these interventions. And, and that may be your way of getting some traction as well. Um, I see a lot of other comments there. Thanks, Corliss. Corliss, did you have another comment that you wanted to make in regards to money? Right. And I and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna call on someone if he's still in here. Josh is in here because one it's it's a I I worked with um Metro Health in their um, social media. And even now with our, um, our Black Women's First, one of our sites has a social uh, a app component. And so when you have um, interventions such as that have technology, um, that gets really expensive. And Josh um, used to work with the um, social media app, which was an excellent, and I'm not just saying this because I was at Project Officer, but it was an excellent app and that they were working with in terms of um, replication, but you have to really have community partnerships, buy-ins, really trying to find funding and so forth. And if, if Josh is still on the line, I would like for him, because I know they were really chasing money um, if he's on the line about that in terms of replication. Hi, uh, yeah, thanks, Corliss. Um, so yeah, I was uh, one of the recipients of the SPIN social media initiative. Um, and I know I'm not the only one on the call. A couple colleagues are also on the call. Um, I'm actually no longer with uh, Metro Health. I'm, I'm now with 
uh, Tappan and CAI just for context. So anything I say could be slightly out of date, but um, I'm still very much in touch with my uh, colleagues at Metro Health and the Positive Peers team. So I would say in, in terms of development, Corliss, you're spot on. That was a lot of money and time devoted to you know, developing an app. It takes a lot to develop an app. And uh, I would also echo, echo um, what was said earlier, uh, not just for replication, but when SPINS initiatives are first being tested um, and developed, yeah. more time is necessary. And especially when you're talking about technology, because these things take a lot of time to code. I mean, most of the time apps take about three to five years to develop. And somehow we got our wonderful partners to develop it in a year and then continue to kind of tweak it. Um, but when it came to replication and sustainability, you know, I would say we were one of the projects that's most successful with that. And it's because we recognize that, you know, it's gonna take us a lot of money as a central holder of all of this um, technology and platforming to run this. Um, but when it comes to wanting to replicate it, nobody's gonna be able to set aside the kind of money that we got from SPINS to develop it. Mm -hmm. um, so I know that they they kind of really negotiated on that to something like 10,000 a year for an entire Brian White TGA or EMA um, to have access to this and um, become a, a partner, uh, which means they get the ongoing data, they get all the reports, um, people can sign up regardless of whether or not EMAs and TGAs jump on, but that was one of the main things that I think put positive peers along with a couple others like PL cares, um, you know, up in the realm of possibility for jurisdictions. And I'm seeing that now as a EAG uh, tap in technical assistance coach, you know, jurisdictions I'm working with are rolling out only certain interventions when it comes to social media. And it's the ones that are well established, have the appropriate funding and don't take a lot from the jurisdiction to put into place. Thank you, Josh. And unfortunately, I have received word that we have to wrap up. <laughs> so maybe that's a recommendation for our next session just to have a longer time to have these discussions. But I have two requests for, for you all as a group. One, take a screenshot of these questions so that you can respond to them or you can, when you get some time, you can send Stacy um, comments or reflections that you may have related to these questions that we put here on the on the um, on the table. And secondly, we encourage you to please take the evaluation. We are um, an organization that believes in improvement and, and continuous quality improvement. And of course, we know surveys are part of that. So we ask that whenever you get the opportunity to please go on, go on to the evaluations. And um, Right now will be a perfect time to do that as you transition off and move on to your next session. So on behalf of PAB's Division of Policy and Data, we really do thank you so much for joining us today. We thank you for the feedback you provided. And we hope that at some point in the future, you can you will see these cha any changes made from some of the feedback that we've received today. So thank you again, everyone. And we wish you a very happy conference.